main task was to make sure that I could listen also to the uh, uh, to the women on the ground and all those that work with women. But I think I try to say that I I think that it will not help uh, that Munuk. Uh, um, has to uh, withdraw or leave. It will not help the fight against sexual violence and I think it will also make it much more difficult for civil society organizations and NGOs. And this is, uh, I guess, a discussion that will also continue for, for some time now. And I hope that we will have a, a, good, um, a good discussion on, on that. Um, but um, I was also impressed by the way that Munuk is, is um, uh, trying to change uh, its practice this is on the ground in, in uh, um, dedicating more of their soldiers also to protecting uh, civilians and that means very often accompanying women to the market or, or other uh, good examples. So the changed mandate or redefined, redefined mandate that the Security Council has given Munuk has helped in steering towards uh, more help uh, to civilians and uh, uh, that means also uh, protecting women. Why should this body that debates uh, war and peace debate the security of women? Well, I'm honored to add my voice to uh, the Council's groundbreaking consideration of that question. And I will also share with you a frank assessment of the gaps in our efforts to address the sexual violence, the challenges I observed on my visit to the DRC, and how my vision and five-point agenda aims to respond. I would like to leave with you two forward-looking recommendations, namely to give sexual violence continuous consideration and to make prevention top priority. From the Trojan War to the nuclear age, rape has existed in symbiotic relationship with armed conflict. And yet, it is a relationship we're just beginning to understand. History has perpetuated the ancient myth of arms and the man, prioritizing the plight of soldiers on the front lines while relegating women to the sidelines. This council, however, has helped redefine the relationship between rape and war, and more broadly, between women, peace and security. Resolution 1820 was a historic response to a heinous reality. It was a response commensurate with the understanding that conflict-related sexual violence is a collective violence aim to destroy not only people, but their sense of being a people. The complementary efforts of other UN bodies to advance gender equality, development and justice are crucial, and I look forward to working with them uh, as a bridge to the broader UN membership. Yet our approach to rape in places where peace and order prevail no more equips us to address systematic rape as a war strategy then our approach to murder prepares us for genocide. In terms of their intent, extent, and impact, the crimes are incomparable. In the wake of World War II, the UN Charter was adopted to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which has brought untold sorrow. But still, the scourge of rape continues, and its sorrows are largely left untold. Succeeding generations continue to be born of rape at gunpoint and stigmatized as the stepchildren of war. Governments and armed groups that tolerate sexual terror make a mockery of the UN Charter and this Council's action to enforce it. Those who employ sexual violence to punish, humiliate, terrorize or displace commit crimes against the victims and crimes against humanity. Sexual violence creates and perpetuates an atmosphere of insecurity. This leads to a drastic decline in the number of girls able to safely attend school and the number of women able to access water points, marketplaces, and polling booths. As a biological weapon, it increases the disease burden on the community, including the HIV and AIDS. It uproots and fractures families dissolving community bonds by turning victims into outcasts, and the psychological scars remain beneath the surface of a society, and like any explosive remnant of war, make peace less possible. Far from being a niche issue, sexual violence is a part of a larger pattern. 
the changing nature of conflict is characterized by an increased civilian combatant interface, which has seen the targeting of populations and the placing of women and girls at ever greater risk. Rule by rape is used by political and military leaders to achieve political, military, and economic ends. Politically motivated rape is a disturbing trend witnessed in the wake of Kenya's contested elections and more recently in broad daylight on the streets of Guinea. Such crimes present a security crisis that demands a security response. So what is the response of the UN system and what is missing? The UN system is generating proposals for effective monitoring and reporting to identify and plug gaps measured against performance benchmarks. And I would like to say a few words about these critical gaps to which my vision is intended to respond. First, the knowledge base on which we act has been impaired by analytical gaps. Perhaps the most insidious is the notion that rape is an inevitable byproduct of war. Sexual violence and its extreme consequences are not intrinsic to conflict and displacement. Rather, there is a sense that rape leaves the perpetrator without blood on their hands, that it can be put down to biological need or the fog of war. So we must be clear. Mass rape is no more natural, inevitable, or acceptable than mass murder. Research reveals variations in the use of war rape and situations in which it is rare. So we know that it is not a necessary corollary of conflict. The UN has traditionally analyzed sexual violence through a gender, reproductive health, and development lens, meaning security factors and actors are often overlooked. But wartime sexual violence is a crime that can be commanded, condoned, or condemned. Once we better understand these dynamics, I'm convinced that prevention is within our power.